Welcome back to Exploring Jewish History and to another episode of Rogues, Rascals and Rapscallions. This one titled The Curious Tale of the Kozhnitz Chernobyl Rebbe of New York. Exploring Jewish History is part of the Fishman Jewish History Lecture Series, sponsored by George and Susie Fishman. This particular episode is sponsored in memory of Susie's mother, Magda Weiss, Shandel, Bas Moshe, Oleha Sholem, whose yard site is on the 10th of Shvat. May her neshama have an aliyah, and may we all be zocher to see Trias Hamesim. I would also like to thank the many people who helped me with information and illustrations in the lead up to every one of these episodes. We now have a thriving and dynamic WhatsApp group of Baker Street Irregulars. And I can tell you on that group, no stone is left unturned and no topic is left undiscussed. We have plenty of history buffs on the group and I truly appreciate the help I get from all of them. Without you guys, I wouldn't have all the info I need to put these videos and podcasts together. So thank you. I'm going to begin this presentation with a reference to my previous presentation, the one about the convicted felon Kamarna Enikel Zayda Meir Schmelner, who masqueraded as a miracle working rabbi during the interwar years and fleeced huge sums of money from credulous Jews in New York, together with his chauffeur driven buck toothed sidekick, Miss Mary Bird. It was as a result of my research into Zayda Meir Schmelner that I first discovered the subject of today's presentation a truly fascinating character called Rabbi Yisrael Tversky, who was the Koznitzer Chernobyl Rebbe of New York and who was also the author of a learned rabbinic work, Sefer Ene Yisrael. And let me tell you this, his story is one of the strangest stories of any rabbi or rebbe that I have ever come across. I'm not kidding. And as you are well aware, I have researched the stories of many of the strangest, most unusual rebbes and rabbis ever to carry these titles. You will recall that Zayda Meir Schmelner and Mary Bird were arrested for grand larceny in New York in 1936. Schmelner refused to post bail on the basis of a rather convoluted argument that if he would post bail, he would be acknowledging that the charges against him were legitimate so instead of posting bail, he languished in jail and throughout the period until the trial commenced, he loudly protested his innocence, using any means at his disposal to publicize his rejection of the charges. On the 17th of September 1937, the Forward newspaper, Forwards, published a two-page op-ed by Zayda Schmelner in which he vigorously protested his innocence. Presented as an Erev Yom Kippur vidui, a so-called confession declaration that Schmelner had written in jail and then mailed to the newspaper's editor, the article was a triumph of bravado over reason. Schmelner rejected his accusers as misinformed fools who had ruined everything by having him arrested and now everyone was going to lose everything. In particular, there would be so many poor and needy people who would suffer as a result of his arrest and imprisonment. Never once in my 35 years as a rabbi, said Schmelner, have I ever enriched myself, although I have had ample opportunity. Rather, he claimed, he had lavished money on those who were less fortunate than him and supported them in their hour of need. Schmelner also declared, that he would make good on all his promises of financial returns to those who had given him money, even if he was found guilty of the accusations that were being hurled at him. The gist of Schmelner's piece is almost like a Robin Hood defense. He seems to be saying, I like giving money to charity cases and I gave fortunes of money away to the poor and all the money I got from people has gone to good causes. So like, give me a freaking break. But this defense was at odds with the actual story of how Schmelner had obtained the money. He had gotten the money when people gave it to him because he had promised them miracles and he had promised them incredible returns on their cash. And those miracles had never come to pass and he also had no money to pay them back. All his promises had turned out to be 
empty words, made so that his hapless victims gave him the money, that immediately went towards his extravagant, over-the-top charitable giving, which, by the time of his arrest, had reached industrial proportions. The Robin Hood of literary legend stole from the rich and gave to the poor. You can argue and debate about whether what he did is morally correct, especially as the rich people who feature in the Robin Hood legends, the Sheriff of Nottingham and all his aristocratic friends, were exploiting and persecuting the poor, which was why Robin targeted them. But Zayda Schmelner wasn't stealing from the rich to give to the poor. He was stealing from the poor to give to the poor. His hapless victims were struggling immigrants with limited money, and yet he still ripped them off and then gave their hard-earned, scarce money to causes he considered needy. Schmelner gave away huge sums of money, and the evidence points to the fact that he gave most of the money he stole away. But there is no virtue in giving away other people's money, however generous you are. What is surprising, though, is that no one really came to Schmelner's defence. You would think that with all his generosity, at the very least, the people who had benefited from his generosity would have come to his defence. But there was nothing, not a peep. Crickets. Although, to be fair, that's not quite true. There was one letter, a passionate letter, that was written in response to the 1937 forward op-ed. It was written by Rabbi Yisrael Tversky, the Koznitsa Chernobyl Rebbe of New York. Admittedly, the letter was never published, even though he submitted it for publication. But I have the original letter, and it is as a result of this extraordinary letter that uh, I have stumbled onto the story of one of the most intriguing rabbis that I have ever researched. Here is the opening paragraph of the letter. There is no addressee, but it was most likely sent to the editor of one of the major contemporary American rabbinic journals, Haparadis, for example, which was the journal published by the Agudas Harabone, or possibly it was Hamasila, the journal published by the Vard Harabonim of New York. Rav Tversky's letter was a direct response to Schmelner's vidui. In the letter, Rav Tversky extols the virtues of someone who, as he frames it, comes clean and confesses his wrongdoings in public. This is what Schmelner has done, he says. Rav Tversky refers to Schmelner as a giboyer and as a manhig hadoyer, he compares him to Rabbi Akiva and to Nochum Ishgamzu from the Gemara, two of our great Talmudic sages who accepted Yisurim, suffering, with unquestioning love of God. He castigates Shmelna's Hasidim and devotees for having abandoned him, although he acknowledges that this might be to do with the huge sums of money he has been accused of stealing after all. His so-called friends don't want to be landed with the bill. I know for sure, Rav Tversky says, that the great rabbi is totally innocent of these shameful accusations. One wonders, on the basis of that extraordinarily confident statement, what exactly Rav Tversky thought Schmelner was confessing to in his vidui. A mystery. There are people who achieve greatness with one great act, writes Rav Tversky. And then there are those whose lives build up towards greatness in many steps and stages. Such a person is Rav Zayda Meir Schmelner, whose many extraordinary acts of kindness slowly elevated him from obscurity to greatness. Rav Tversky also makes a particularly astonishing claim about Schmelner's charitable giving. At a specific point in time, he says, and he's probably referring to the period immediately after the devastating stock market crash of 1929, all the yeshivas in New York were forced to shut down. According to him, there were eight yeshivas altogether, 
and he mentions Torah Vadas, Masifta, and Chaim Berlin by name. And guess who stepped in to save them? None other than Zayda Meir Schmelner. Then there were very few people who knew about what he did, writes Rav Tversky. But now it is time to publicize it. 130 yeshiva rebbe's had no work and no income. Thousands of Jewish children were in danger of being denied a proper Jewish education. And it was only because of Schmelner's generosity that the day was saved. Like a knight in shining armor, he swept in with oodles of cash and the yeshivas remained opened. It's almost 100 years later and we have no way of verifying this claim. The truth is, every yeshiva at that time was always on the brink of imminent collapse. Schmelner may have been a savior at one point in time, but there were many others besides for him who saved yeshivas from collapse. Each story was a miracle of muzzle over expectation. But in any event, true or not, the journal editor to whom Rav Tversky sent his mellifluous Schmelner exalting prose was apparently unmoved. He sent back the article in the original envelope with his succinct pencil written notes on the back. Kavanosai Ratsuya. His intention is desirable. Ulamase Eina Ratsuya. But practically, this is not desirable. Shev va'altase odif. It is better to sit and do nothing. In other words, how nice of Rav Tversky to defend his friend Schmelner so enthusiastically and with such determination. But frankly, we wouldn't touch this article with a barge pole. Thank you, but no thank you. So, I bet you are wondering, who exactly was Rav Yisrael Tversky? the Koznitzer Chernobyl Rebbe of New York, the lone voice of defense for the munificent scoundrel Zayda Meir Schmelner? And why would a reputable Hasidic Rebbe raise his voice to defend such a scoundrel in the first place? I think I know the answer to the second question. And I'll get to it in a moment. And I think you already know the answer to the first question, because if the title of this series is Rogues, Rascals and Rapscallions, perhaps the Koznitzer Chernobyl Rebbe of New York was not so reputable after all. Don't worry, I'll get to that too. First, let me explain why I think Rav Tversky advocated for Schmelner. The clue is in the article which contained Schmelner's vidui, published by Forward. In the fourth column of the article, buried among Schmelner's pleadings and whining, is the story of a Hasidische Rebbe Schmelner claims to have rescued from eviction for owing $700. Ich hab geholfen a Rebbe, writes Schmelner. I helped a Rebbe. Welcher is de greste meichis in Hantigador? This Rebbe has the best pedigree of any Rebbe in our generation. And don't forget, Schmelner himself had pedigree. He was a descendant of the Kumarana dynasty and he was a son-in-law of the Shotzer Rebbe. But this unnamed Rebbe, whoever he was, was de Greste Meichis in Hante Gedor, even more pedigreed than Schmelner or than anyone else he'd ever met. He was royalty, even to royalty. He was a cut above the rest. Not only that, wrote Schmelner, there was more. Er is a reiner heiligene Schummer. He is a pure and holy soul. This Rebbe fell on hard times, Schmelner continued, and no one wanted to help him. And if I wouldn't have stepped in at the right time and given him $700, they would have thrown him and his family out onto the street. Who could he have been referring to? Who was the biggest meichus of all the Rebbes in America in 1937. For the answer to that, all you need to do is look at the introduction to Rav Yisrael Tversky's Sefer Eni Yisrael, which was published by the Wolf Printing Company the very same year in 1937. 
the learned tome, which opens with a gushing endorsement letter written by the Yeshua Heschel Rabinovich, the Monastery Rebbe of New York, who calls Rab Tversky his beloved relative and friend, is introduced with a prefatory foreword which lists all of Rab Tversky's illustrious forebears. And here they are. Rabbi Yehuda Leib Cohen, who was a disciple of the Magid of Mezrich and author of the venerated Hasidic work Ur HaGonuz. Rabbi Menachem Nochem Tversky of Chernobyl, a disciple of the Baal Shem Tov and of the Mezrich Magid and the author of Ma'ir Enayim. And of course, the founder of the Chernobyl dynasty with all of its many branches. Rabbi Limelech of Lizhensk, one of Hasidism's most renowned masters, author of the highly regarded Noam Elimelech. Rabbi Shral Hopstein, the celebrated Magid of Koznitz, who was the founder of the proliferate Koznitz dynasty. Rabbi Avram Yeshua Heschel of Apta. Rabbi Gedalia of Linitz, who was the son-in-law of Rabbi Pinchas Koretzer. And then finally, the ultimate prized ancestor of any Hasidic Rebbe, the Baal Shem Tov, who was the founder and originator of Hasidus. Wow, quite a list, don't you agree? It's a who's who of Hasidism's founding aristocracy. And after hearing that list, you can well understand why Zayda Schmelner would have served that Rav Tversky was the Gresta Meyichus in the Hante Gedor. Think about it. All these A-list Rebbes on Rav Tversky's list of ancestors had numerous Hasidic Rebbes who were their direct descendants and an equal amount of Hasidic Rebbes who had married into their families, which essentially meant that Rav Yisrael Tversky was related to just about every Rebbe anyone had ever heard of. As I said, he was royalty, even to royalty. Quite unbelievable. The thing is... When something sounds too good to be true, come on, you know the score. You know what I'm about to say. If it sounds too good to be true, it usually isn't true. Rav Tversky signed his name in Ene Yisrael as Yisrael ben Rav Shlema Zev of Koznitz. I started doing a little research. There were a couple of branches of the Chernobyl dynasty of the Tversky family that had a Hasidic following in Poland in the late 19th century and early 20th century. They were offshoots of the Ukraine-based Trisk and Cherkas Hasidic groups. But these Hasidim were called Triska Hasidim and Cherkas Hasidim, not Koznitsa Hasidim and not Chernobyl Hasidim. Meanwhile, central Poland where the Koznitz Chassidus was founded and based, had dozens of Koznitz Rebelech and Gitayidin, but to my knowledge, none of them had the surname Tversky. They were all either Hopsteins or Shapiras. The whole thing made no sense to me. Who was this Chernobyl descendant called Tversky who was a Koznitz Rebbe, and how did he end up in America? I turned to my friend Yitz Tversky, who is the expert on all things Chernobyl and Tversky related, and whose beautiful book, here it is, Admoria Malchut's Space Chernobyl, is one of the most amazing books ever produced, show showcasing a Hasidic dynasty. Who is this Chernobyl descendant? I asked Yitz. Which branch is he from? I can't find any trace of this Koznitz Tversky family. Yitz laughed. That's because his real name wasn't Tversky. And I don't think he is related to any Tversky on the vast Chernobyl family tree. Not one. And as far as I can tell, he's not related to any Koznitz branch either. You're kidding me, I said. No, I'm not, replied Yitz. The guy was an imposter. He was never a Rebbe. His father was never a Rebbe. No one in his family was ever a Hasidic Rebbe anywhere in Europe at any point in time. The whole Koznitz Chernobyl Tversky connection is fake news. It never happened. Period. And so began my journey into the life story of someone who got so 
deeply rooted into his adopted persona that, believe it or not, he went to the grave never having broken cover. His so-called yichus is etched onto his gravestone, and to this day his descendants continue to insist that they are Chernobyl offspring, despite the irrefutable evidence to the contrary. And so, now, for the first time ever, I can reveal to you the full story of Rav Yisrael Tversky, the Koznitzer Chernobyl Rebbe of New York. His real name wasn't Yisrael Tversky. It was Yisrael Issa Hakoyen Schwarz, and he was born in 1897 in Lublin, Poland, not in Chernobyl, Ukraine, as he later claimed. It would appear he dropped the name Isser because this was not a common name in Russia and Ukraine, so it was better just to be called Yisrael, which could mean that he was named after the Koznitsa Magid, or even the Balshemtov, neither of whom was called Yisrael Isser. Here is a record of Yisrael Isser's birth from the archives in Dublin, Poland. Yisrael Issa's father was Shlomo Wolf Hakoyen Schwarz, a native of Lublin, as were his parents, Moshe Leib and Maria. Yisrael Issa's mother was Leah Bina Freiburger, who was born in 1861 to Avadia and Chana Brandl Freiburger. Leah Bina died when Yisrael Issa was just three years old, in the same year as her newborn son, Yisrael Issa's younger brother, Avadia, he also died. All of this is documented in the archives in Lublin. In 1917, at the age of 20, Yisrael Issa got married in Lublin to 19-year-old Henna Gittel Levinson, the daughter of Moshe Shlomo Levinson and Dreza Rolnik. I hope you're keeping track. Are you listening carefully? So far, no Tverskis, no Hopsteins, no Shapiras, just ordinary Jewish folk from Lublin. Yisrael Isser and Hannah Gittel had three children in Lublin. On June 18, 1918, their first son was born, Gershon Hennach, later known as Henry Jerome. On November 19, 1920, their second son was born, Yaakov Tanchemer, later known as Jacob. And on August 10, 1923, their third son was born, Avadia Elimelech, later known as Victor. They had a fourth son as well, David. I'll get to him a bit later on. You may be wondering, how do I know that Rabbi Yisrael Tversky is not who he says he is, but is actually Yisrael Issa HaKoyen Schwarz? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Rabbi Yisrael Tversky and Yisrael Issa HaKoyen Schwarz are actually two totally different people. So why am I connecting them and saying that they are the same person? The truth is, it's a good question, but the answer is even better. I know that they are the same person because Yisrael Issa Cohen Schwarz slipped up a few times on documents and in information that he submitted after his arrival in the United States. According to records kept on Ellis Island, Rav Yisrael Tversky was 29 years old when he arrived in America for the first time in New York on his own on March 5, 1926, on the German passenger liner SS Berlin. Here is the ship manifest with the record of his details. His last residence is recorded as having been Pressburg, Bratislava, Czechoslovakia, but his birthplace is listed as Chernobyl, Russia, 1897. Okay, so far he is on his own and Yisrael Tversky in the manifest could be a member of the Tversky family who was seeking refuge in the United States. There were many Tverskys in the United States by the late 1920s, even Yisrael Tverskys, and many more Tverskys would still come. So much so that Rav Yosef Eliyahu Henkin, America's first major poisek, and head of Ezra's Torah, the non-profit that supported needy rabbis and their families, thought that all Hasidic Rebbes had the surname Tversky. You think I'm kidding? I'm absolutely not kidding. I mean it, and I can prove it. Here is a check from my ephemera collection, 
with Rav Henkin's handwriting and signature. Rav Henkin made the check out to Rav Aaron Halberstam of Gorlitz, New York, but the recipient's name, where the recipient's name is written, it doesn't say Rav Aaron Halberstam, look carefully, it says Rabbi Aaron Twersky, and that's Rav Henkin who wrote it. So how do I know it was meant for Rav Aaron Halberstam? Simple, because on the back of the check, Rav Aaron Halberstam endorsed it using the surname Halberstam, not Twersky, because that wasn't his surname. Although, full disclosure, Rab Aaron Halberstam's mother was Yecheved Rivka Twersky, the daughter of Rab Mordechadov Twersky of Hornishtaipel Kalenkovich. But, be that as it may, to be perfectly frank, I find it very hard to believe that Rav Henkin, who is a blue blood Litvak and clueless about Hasidic Yichus and Mishpachology, would have known who Rab Aaron Halberstam's mother was and would have therefore have confused the surnames when he wrote the checkout. But I digress, as I tend to do. Please forgive me. Where was I? Oh, yes. Yisrael Twersky arrived on his own to New York on the SS Berlin. He could have been a Chernobyl Twersky. So why do I think he's Schwarz? I'll tell you why. Because when his family arrived, his wife and three sons, their first names are all exactly the same as Yisrael Issa Schwarz's wife and children's first names. And guess what? Their surnames are all Schwarz, not Tversky. Take a look at the ship manifest that shows the family's arrival. Here's a close-up of the names as they appear on the manifest. And then, just two years later, in the 1930 US census, there they all are. Take a look at the names. Yes, Hannah Gittel's name is reduced to just Hannah, but the kids' names are the same as they were. And all their surnames have miraculously changed to Twersky. In 1934, Yisrael Issa petitioned for immigration, giving the name Israel Twersky, and in his 1936 Declaration of Intention, he's also Israel Twersky. There's no Schwarz in there. But now, take a look at Yisrael Issa's 1939 naturalization document. Take a look at the close-up of his name. Do you see that? All of a sudden, he's not Israel Twersky, he's Israel Schwarz Twersky. And take a look at a close-up of his signature. Same handwriting, but now he signs himself Israel Schwarz Twersky. The cat is well and truly out of the bag. Although, as you can see on the document, he is still claiming to have been born in Chernobyl, which was a lie. He was born in Lublin. Now look at his U.S. immigration admission card issued on January 30th, 1940. Do you see that? It says Israel Schwarz Twersky. And take a look at the signature on his Oath of Allegiance document. Once again, he signs his name as Israel Schwarz Twersky. Okay, you may be wondering, why does any of this matter? Who cares if some random guy, an immigrant from Poland, wants to change his name from Schwarz to Twersky. If it floats his boat, what difference does it make? Surely there were thousands of people who altered their names when they arrived in the United States. New life, new name, why bother even talking about it? The answer is simple, because none of those thousands of name-changing folk paraded themselves around New York claiming to be the scions of great Hasidic dynasties. And presumably, Yisrael Schwarz Twersky did it because he expected handsome payments for his blessings and for appearing in a shul and staying there for Shabbos. Take a look at these adverts in the Jewish newspapers in the late 20s and the 1930s, promoting the upcoming visits to local shuls across New York of the superstar celebrity rabbinic luminary the holy Koznitzer Chernobyl Rebbe Rav Yisrael Twersky. 
He even signed onto a promotional advert for Manishevitz Matzus, along with many rabbis, as Rav Yisrael Tversky. Now, all the other rabbis signed using their real names. He used a fake name. What kind of rabbi does that? Yisrael Issa even created a business card, promoting himself as Rabbi Yisrael Tversky of Kozhnitz. His star shone very brightly, and he reaped the rewards. On January 20th, 1934, the Yiddish newspaper Der Tog published a letter from Yisrael Isser in his guise as the Kozhnitzer Rebbe, in which he extolled the virtues of Saratoga leaf baths, which he said cured him from a months-long bout of painful rheumatism. In another article, this one in English, Yisrael Issa's visit to the Beis Tfilah Shalosh Sudus was enthusiastically promoted. Rabbi Tversky is considered one of the greatest Hasidic rebbeim of our time, the newspaper gushed. Residents and tourists who wish to have an Oineg Ruchni are urged to be present. So, I guess you're wondering, why did he do it? This charade must have been totally exhausting. And at any moment in time, he might be exposed. Someone who knew him from Poland could appear out of nowhere and say, hey, one second, that's not the Koznitzer Eber. That's Srili Schwarz from Lublin. We used to play marbles together on Krakowski Predichme Street. Can you imagine the pressure of thinking that that could happen at any moment in time? Why would he do that to himself? Every day, for years and years, week after week, day after day, pretending to be someone you're not. And it's not as if he was a hermit hiding at home. He, he was in the public eye, a synagogue rabbi and an itinerant preacher. It's truly unbelievable. How did he do it? Why did he do it? The answer to these troubling questions can be found in an autobiographical book written by Yisrael Issa's son, Jacob. The book is called The Sound of the Walls, and it was published in 1959, five years after Yisrael Tversky died. Jacob doesn't mention anywhere in the book the fact that his father, Rav Tversky, was not in fact Rav Tversky at all. But the autobiography does contain a tragic piece of information which is the key that unlocks this whole story. Let me explain what I mean by quoting a review of the book that appeared when it came out. The Sound of the Walls was reviewed by the New York Times and this is what the reviewer said. This autobiography could be many a man's life. The hero grew up in Brooklyn, went through high school, then City College, where he became a member, then captain of the wrestling team, took postgraduate work at Columbia University, became a teacher in the history department at City College, met a young woman, fell in love, was married and had a daughter. The only difference is that Jacob Tversky was completely blind. When he was four years old, a boy in Poland, he was stricken by scarlet fever and complications caused him to go blind. At first, he could see light and shadows, but by the age of 12, he had stopped seeing light and the world had turned to an empty greyness. That's the key to the whole story. Jacob describes how he began to lose his sight and how his father, desperate to help him restore his sight, resolved to immigrate with his wife and sons to America, where the doctors were far more advanced than they were in Poland. Yusrael Issa was sure that in America there would be a doctor who would be able to do something, anything, for Jacob. But how would an anonymous immigrant rabbi who only spoke Yiddish pay for all the medical expenses? Doctors cost money, medical procedures cost money, and money doesn't grow on trees. Jacob doesn't address this topic in his book, The Sound of the Walls, but I think I know the answer. If Srili Schwarz from Lublin moved to America, 
he would sink without a trace. But if Rav Yisrael Tversky, scion of Chernobyl and Kozhnitz, the descendant of every Hasidic great from Russia and Poland, even of the Baal Shem Tov, moved to America, he would take the country by storm. People would pay to see him, and they would give him money to pray for them, and they would listen closely to his speeches, and the money he earned from all of this would be used to pay for Jacob's medical bills. That's what happened. Not that it helped. Sadly, Jacob went blind anyway. But by then, it was too late. The revered Kozhnitz Chernobyl Rebbe couldn't suddenly drop his cover and say, Sorry, guys, it was all a big mistake. I'm actually Yisrael Issa Schwartz. I was having you all on. I'm neither Chernobyl nor Kozhnitz. I'm just an ordinary chap from Poland, masquerading as a member of a bunch of famous families because I wanted to raise money to pay for my son's medical bills. I mean, how do you think that would have sounded to those who had been fooled? Jacob writes of an elderly couple who walked for miles every Shabbos just to spend the last hour of the holy day with a man they knew as the Kozhnitsa Chernobyl Rebbe. They wanted to bask in his shadow because their ancestors had followed his ancestors, except that they weren't his ancestors because he'd made it all up. But once Yisrael Issa was caught up in the con, he could never change back to who he really was. It had to be his persona for the rest of his life. And while his wife must have known the truth, his kids never knew. And as far as they were concerned, they were the children of a highly pedigreed Hasidish Rebbe. But now I have another question. How did Yisrael Issa Schwartz fool the monastery Rebbe, Rabbi Yeshua Heschel Rabinovich, who was a relative of the Tversky's, into believing that he was Yisrael Tversky. Surely the monastritcher would have probed into this man's credentials and even the most basic questions would have sent up red flags and set off alarm bells, alerting him to the fact that the guy was an imposter. And yet the monastritcher not only considered Rav Yisrael Tversky his relative, he even wrote a complimentary endorsement of his Sefer Ene Yisrael how do you figure that one? Even more puzzling, Reb Sholem Yosef Tversky of Trisk, New York, who was a real bona fide Chernobyl descendant, invited Yisrael Issa, the imposter, to spend Shabbos with him and treated him like a close relative. Here is the advert promoting the Shabbos, and you can see the Triska Rebbe's name clearly on the advert. How was that even possible? Didn't the Triska Rebbe smell that something was off about this guy? Although, you've got to give it to Yisrael Issa. He had incredible guts. Imagine pretending to be someone's cousin when you're not and spending Shabbos with them. It's horrifyingly awesome. To understand how it was even possible that genuine Tversky family members fell for Yisrael Issa, I think you need to understand that in an age before the phenomenon of widespread information and of frequent easy travel, it was perfectly possible to have distant relatives you didn't really know much about and never saw, and one day you could meet them somewhere and they could tell you that they are your third cousin or whatever, and you'd believe them. Even today, it's possible you could meet someone and they say, Hi there, I'm the great-grandson of your grandfather's second cousin. Are you really going to check your family tree with a fine tooth comb to see if that person is lying? You would take it at face value. And that's it. The monastery Rebbe was not himself descended from the Tversky family. His daughter Fager married Reb Sholem Yosef Tversky of Trisk in 1903, but she died a month after the wedding. And then Reb Sholem Yosef remarried to Yen Terezel Smilovitz. Twenty years later, after experiencing a terrible pogrom in Uman, where the family lived, in which two of Reb Sholem Yosef's daughters were killed, Chavalea and Batsheva, and in the midst of the terrible upheaval caused by the Russian civil war, Reb Sholem Yosef moved to New York 
together with his former father-in-law, the monastery Tereba, who had lost a son in the same pogrom, among 120 other victims who were killed. Trisk was almost 300 miles away from Chernobyl. So even if Yisrael Issa said he was born in Chernobyl, Reb Sholem Yosef wouldn't have questioned it. The sticky point of Yisrael Issa being a Koyen could be explained away as him having taken his mother's surname, which was quite common in Russia, done to confuse the authorities with regard to military conscription. Yisrael Issa could tell his quote-unquote cousins that his mother was a Tversky and that she had married a Koyen, but he was still a Chernobyl descendant. I have a letter that Yisrael Issa wrote to Reb Chanoi Chenech Tversky, the Malina Rebbe of Chicago, who you might recall was Reb Osher Zilberstein of Los Angeles' brother-in-law, the brother of Reb Osher's first wife. The letter, which opens with Yisrael Issa referring to Reb Chanoch Henoch as his dear relative, accompanied a copy of Ene Yisrael that Yisrael Issa mailed to him. How did he get away with it? Simple, because the Malin Rebbe lived in Chicago and probably never met Yisrael Issa in his life and would never have suspected that someone called Yisrael Tversky, who claimed in a letter to be his relative, was in fact a barefaced imposter. Interestingly, a few years after moving to New York, Yisrael Issa stopped using the title Chernobyl Rebbe and referred to himself on his business card and his stationery as the Koznitzer Rebbe only. Presumably, this was after the arrival in 1934 of the real Chernobyl Rebbe, Reb Shlomo Shmuel Tversky, whose parents had both been born Tversky, who had lived in Chernobyl for most of his life, and who lived and breathed the Chernobyl dynasty in every facet of his being. Reb Shlomo Shmuel would have known that Yisrael Issa was a fake in a minute, under a minute. So Yisrael Issa avoided him, and even after Reb Shlomo Shmuel died and his son Reb Yaakov Yisrael took his place, Yisrael Issa refrained from making any further public references to his Chernobyl connections. And then, after 1942, when the Koznitzer Rebbe of Yisrael Eloza Hopstein arrived in New York, Yisrael Issa quietly dropped the Koznitz title as well. You remember your Yisrael Eloza Hopstein, right? He was the Yablona Rebbe's partner in the creation of Kvar Chassidim during the 1920s, after which he went to Paris before escaping from the Nazis and making his way to the United States. There was no way Yisrael Issa would have been able to fool the real Koznitzer Rebbe. So he didn't try. The letterhead he used after 1942 made no mention of either Koznitz or Chernobyl. And it is not surprising that without having the status of a famous Hasidic title, Yisrael Issa faded into obscurity and then, after a few short years, he suddenly died following a short illness. It was January 1954 and he was 56 years old. Yisrael Issa's gravestone revisits all of his ridiculous ancestry claims. His second name, Issa, is missing although he is referred to as Hakoyen. Presumably, his children never even knew he had a second name, but they did, of course, know that they were Koyhanim, and most probably they took the details of his ancestry from the introduction to his book and then included it in the text for his gravestone. And why wouldn't they? They had no reason to disbelieve any of it. More recently, though, in the past few years, when Yisrael Issa's family has been challenged regarding their fanciful claimed ancestry, they have rejected any suggestion that Yisrael Issa was a fraud. They claim to have a private document that shows just how they are descended from all the great Chassidish Rebbes, but they adamantly refuse to share that document with anyone, for good reason, because it would never stand up to close scrutiny. Last July, I was in Boca Raton, where one of Yisrael Issa's grandchildren live, and I sent them an email while I was there. This is what I wrote. Dear dot dot dot, please excuse this intrusion. I am a history research buff who regularly presents curious anecdotes of Jewish history 
to a wide audience of listeners and viewers via YouTube and SoundCloud. I have been informed that you are a grandchild of Rabbi Israel Twersky, who was a rabbi in Brooklyn and claimed descent from various Hasidic dynasties. These claims have been dismissed as misinformation, and although Rabbi Twersky's rabbinic qualifications have never been questioned, his credentials as a Hasidic Rebbe have. I was wondering if you could shed any light on this and perhaps share any relevant information that might clear up this enduring historical puzzle. Although I live in Beverly Hills, California, I happen to be in Boca for a couple of days and would be delighted to spend some time with you if you are able to meet me. I look forward to hearing back from you at your convenience. They never responded. Perhaps I will hear from them when this presentation goes live on YouTube. Incidentally, I have Yisrael Issa's rabbinic credentials. On the face of it, they seem first class. I, I don't have his original smichov certificates, but I do have the translations that he sent out so that he could obtain his Board of Rabbis certification. There are two smichas, one from Rabbi Leo Klatskin, the Lublinerov, who is a Talmud Chochem of epic proportions, on par with the Rogachova for his photographic memory. He later lived in Yerushalayim. I have spoken about him in the past. I think the Klatskin smicha might be real, even though Yisrael Issa's surname has been changed in the translation from Schwarz to Tversky, and the name Isser is missing. Yisrael Issa was without any question a solid rabbinic scholar. He was very fluent in Hebrew at the highest level, and it makes sense that he would have had a smicha from the chief rabbi of his hometown. But who knows? Unless we see the original, we must treat the unverified smicha translation as potentially fake. The other smicha is much more obscure. It is signed by Rabbi Yaakov Arye Eisenzweig, who was a dyan in Warsaw and also head of the local smicha program in the rabbinical seminary. If I'm perfectly frank, this smicha has to be a fake, as it mentions that Yisrael Issa was a community rabbi in Preshburg for several years, which makes no sense whatsoever, as he never lived outside Poland, as far as I know. So, unless Yisrael Issa got Rav Eisenzweig to write him a false letter, unless he managed to do that somehow, and we don't have the original, so we can't be sure, it is more than likely that Yisrael Issa made this one up. I mentioned earlier that Yisrael Issa claimed when he arrived in America that he'd been staying with his uncle in Preshburg, Bratislava, and in several adverts that promoted him as the Koznitsa Chernobyl Rebbe, his residence in Preshburg is mentioned, probably because he wanted to attract Jews who originated in the Austro-Hungarian Empire to attend his Shabbos gigs. And so, perhaps that's where he got the idea to add Preshburg to his resume for the smicha. Who knows? His motives in this instance are lost in the mists of time. I have another couple of odds and ends to tidy up before I conclude. Firstly, Yisrael Issa's fourth son, David Twersky, who was born in New York in 1931. He was a rabbi and an educator in New Jersey for decades and was buried there when he passed away in January 2020. Here is an article about him from August 1960 when he was appointed head of, the sc head of school at Hillel Academy in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. I saw online that the author, Joshua Braff, has written a blog about his experiences at Hillel Academy in Perth Amboy. And I just want to share a couple of lines with you because it is really quite amusing. They say, write what you know. My first novel, is about a yeshiva boy who leaves his religious education to attend a public school in suburban New Jersey. I drew from my own personal memories of a building in Perth Amboy called Hillel Academy, a place that was so ill-prepared to teach 
that it was torn down a few years after I left. And he goes on in the same vein. Look it up. It's a funny piece. Another important point. Yisrael Issa Sefer Eni Yisrael was not a complete work. He divided it into three topics. I have, this is the manuscript of it here. And they are Ein Kedem, Ein Tzalmoin, and Ein Tzedek, Umishbat. But there is an additional unpublished section called Ein Emuna. I have the manuscript here. In this fourth section, Yisrael Issa shows his fluency in medieval Jewish philosophy and quotes extensively from Mer Nevuchim, Kuzari, Er Hashem, and Dikorim, which I have to say are not Sforim that are regular, regularly quoted by Hasidish Rebbes, or even irregularly quoted by Hasidish Rebbes. Which brings me to my final point, also about his Sefer. I found it curious that he doesn't regularly quote Ramchal, Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato, anywhere in his Sefer. It's a Sefer on Machshova, and Ramchal is the master of Machshova. I don't think I need to tell you that Ramchal is quoted in so many Sforim from the 20th century that deal with philosophical and Kabbalistic topics, probably in all of them. But there's a good reason Ramchal is not quoted in Yisrael Issa Sefer. Do you know why? Because there are countless instances where Sefer Ene Yisrael directly plagiarizes Das Tfunais by Ramchal. Yep, Yisrael Issa passes off Ramchal's work as if it's his own. These are just a few pages of examples. Take a look. Eni Yisrael is in Rashi script and Das Tfunais is in the square letters. Literally, it is exactly the same, word for word. I'd like to thank the Baker Street Irregular, he wishes to remain nameless, who did the work for me and put this document together. And just so you know, there's plenty more. This is just the tip of the iceberg. I guess once you are a Goynev Das, it doesn't stop with changing your surname. It extends to everything else as well. Well, that just about concludes the curious tale of the Koznitz Chernobyl Rebbe of New York, Yisrael Isser Hakoyen Schwarz, a.k.a. Rav Yisrael Tversky. I have much more to say about him, including numerous gems from his correspondence archives, which I have here it's in my Judaica collection. Maybe one day I'll get to it all. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching or listening and for being part of my Jewish History Chevra. Hopefully, I'll be back soon with another episode. And don't forget, keep your eyes open for good stories. And if you come across a good story, share it with me by email, pinnydunner at gmail.com. Thank you so much. And until next time, goodbye. goodbye.